Welcome back. This is Dr. Dave Bullis, Director of Ambulatory Behavioral Medicine here at the Cancer Center. Uh, and this is the What's Next class, uh, Survivorship Edition, uh, Episode 4. Uh, so um, we've already gone through uh, some of the basics uh, and also reviewed uh, how to cope uh, with some of the physical challenges. Uh, this episode is really about what to expect uh, in terms of your thinking and mentally. <clears throat> So uh, mental challenges, uh, they refer to how we think, what we think about, how we manage our expectations, and essentially anything that is on our minds. And this is uh, different than our emotions, which we'll get to in the next episode. Um, but it's just sort of thinking about the thinking process. So uh, cognitive issues, in terms of people call this sort of the chemo brain idea, uh, and there have been some studies that have shown up to 75% uh, of all cancer patients who have received chemotherapy experience some kind of mental impairment uh, during treatment. Uh, and what that is defined as is different for everybody, uh, and we'll go into that in a little bit. But, um, and then for some patients, these problems uh, persist uh, months to years after completing chemotherapy, and this is what people talk about is chemo brain. Uh, most people, that does not happen. Uh, but it can. Um, it's important to recognize that these symptoms are real, uh, even if the cause is not exactly clear, uh, because I think the deficits can be caused related to physical stuff like we just talked about with the physical challenges. Your body has been through a lot. Uh, but then there's also, um, depending on how your brain uh, has functioned, uh, there can be processes in, that um, interfere with attention and, and, and that sort of thing. Uh, and then also there's just a lot on your mind sometimes. <laughs> uh, this has been a, been a challenging uh, phase of life. So uh, we expect people to have uh, some emotional challenge. So the research has not been really good at figuring out why people uh, have uh, cognitive issues, um, but they are certainly real. Um, and one of the things that's important uh, for both you and your uh, caregivers and your support system, your family, is just to really also be clear about comparing how you're doing uh, after treatment as with how you were doing uh, before treatment. So you have a realistic uh, comparison um, for what your brain is doing. Because it's one of those things where if you, you know, only got four hours of sleep last night, your brain's not going to be working as well. Um, as it would be if you'd gotten eight hours of sleep, um, speaking for myself personally. Um, so that's something that is a, a, a reality, uh, but it's not a permanent reality. Uh, so it's important to kind of compare yourself to what you were like beforehand. Uh, and then there's many contributing factors that, uh, address, that, are, that are reversible, uh, and they can be and should be addressed. Uh, and those things include anything from anxiety and depression to uh, poor sleep and fatigue, also pain, uh, and then also managing just a, a busy life um, can also be a factor. So what are some of the cognitive issues that people report? Um, there's difficulty paying attention, especially in complex and noisy places like hospitals, malls, uh, downtown uh, cities, uh, urban environments. Uh, difficulty remembering things, especially lists of things uh, that require you to remember more than uh, one or two things, and that can be, you know, uh, grocery lists or uh, lists of uh, to-do lists for the uh, weekend. Um, there can also be uh, some problem problem solving, uh, where you sort of you're faced with a, a challenge and you just can't think your way through. Like, what should I do first? What should I do second? Uh, this is especially true when there's uh, time pressure and people are saying, uh, you know, I need your answer right now. What are you going to do? Uh, that's a very common uh, challenge. Uh, people find that multitasking, something that many people feel like they were good at before cancer treatment, um, all of a sudden becomes just uh, too hard. Uh, people oftentimes describe uh, walking around their house and seeing many different tasks all started uh, but none completed. Uh, in the sense, you, uh, you, you're you working on something and then you get distracted and you go do something else and then you uh, get distracted again and you go do a third thing and then you kind of wonder what, what were you doing on that first thing again. Um, some people report uh, kind of finding the, finding the word uh, to be difficult, the right word at the right time to be difficult. Um, this sort of word finding thing is, is really 
worrisome, of course, because it makes people think they're they're losing their they're losing their mind. Uh, it's also true that it you know oftentimes the word will come to you uh, after the conversation's over while you're in the car driving home. You think, oh, I wish I had said that, and that was the word I was looking for, and um, so that's a very common uh, issue. Uh, and then there's also just the general feeling like your head's in the cloud or your your brain is sitting in cold molasses and you just, you know, no matter how hard you push it, it just won't go. And uh, so these are all uh, kind of examples. Um, they're not exclusive. There are other ones I'm sure people may come up with. Uh, but these are very common uh, challenges that people report. So why does it happen? Uh, well, uh, any number of reasons, as you might guess. Um, so oncology uh, medications themselves, uh, the chemotherapy, uh, oftentimes has a very direct effect on energy and uh, blood pressure and other, uh, other factors that make it hard to kind of think straight. Um, also, uh, some of the treatments are, are hormone-based uh, for uh, testosterone uh, depletion or um, estrogen, uh, progesterone um, uh, suppression. Uh, all of those kind of hormone treatments, uh, hormones are actively involved in the uh, way our brains work. Uh, and so when we are uh, suppressing those hormones, uh, hormones uh, we, um, people oftentimes feel uh, that effect uh, mentally uh, more than anything else. Um, there can be lots of distractions. Uh, once one has gone through cancer treatment, one can oftentimes be very hypervigilant about any new ache and pain or other things going on in the world. Uh, and those distractions interfere with us paying attention and being able to remember things. Um, for some people, it's just a lack of interest. They, uh, they just don't care as much as they used to. After all they've been through, they're kind of worn down physically, uh, mentally, and then also emotionally, and that lack of interest means that it's hard to uh, remember uh, things later. Um, so uh, pain, uh, obviously pain is a distractor. Uh, the treatment of the pain with the medications can be a sedative uh, process, and that also interferes with paying attention and thinking, uh, and that's where people notice it the most. Um, fatigue, as noted before, alcohol, obviously noted before, either for recreational or stress management purposes. Um, these are all things that interfere with the brain's ability to take in information, and one of the the things to think about cognitive issues is that the brain is kind of like a library uh, and information has to go into that library and then for that library to be of any use you have to be able to go back later and get that information out. Uh, and so if there is anything that interferes with information getting into your uh, memory uh, for any of these reasons listed, uh, it's not going to be there later uh, when you go back to find it. Uh, and that's a very specific kind of memory disorder uh, that happens in what we typically think of uh, as chemo brain. So what do you do about it? Well, first we want to just recognize uh, that the cognitive issues uh, related to cancer treatment are typically not permanent. Uh, and I say typically meaning most of the time they're not permanent. Um, if there was thinking problems before treatment, so some people had memory disorders uh, because of aging or other uh, ailments beforehand, um, the chemotherapy is not going to make those better, obviously. Uh, but the to the to the extent that you've had a, a memory challenge or a, a thinking challenge related to the chemotherapy or the radiation or the hormone treatments. Those are not permanent. Uh, when you uh, stop the treatment, uh, the, the functioning should return. Um, it can be useful to, again, and this is, you'll hear this theme again and again, is to get the medical team to uh, really look at what are the reversible causes for any kind of confusion, if there are any. Uh, and this is really the, the purview of neurology. Uh, and we have a really great neurology team here at Newton Wellesley. And so it would be useful uh, if you really are finding that the memory problems are getting in your way. Uh, again, it's one thing to walk into the room and, and forget why you came in there and then go back out and remember and then come back in and do what you need to do. Uh, that kind of thing's annoying, but it doesn't necessarily interfere with your life. Uh, if you're really forgetting to go to appointments, if you're forgetting uh, people's names, that sort of thing, uh, these are obviously much more uh, severe uh, interferences. 
and you really want to talk to a doctor who specializes in brain function, and, and that's really neurology. Um, so it's also important just from a psychological perspective to recognize that uh, it's not your fault that your brain is not functioning at f full capacity. Uh, and again, this is, there's a lot in survivorship, there's a lot of kind of giving yourself permission to heal at whatever uh, rate you heal at. Uh, and it's good to complain about these things and tell your medical team about them, but also recognize that your body's doing the best it can, uh, physically, mentally, uh, specifically. Um, and so you want to make sure that you give yourself permission to uh, kind of heal at whatever rate uh, is naturally going to occur. Um, what else can you do about it? Well, so the medication piece, and this is where talking with your primary care doctor, especially talking to your oncology provider uh, while you're with them, uh, and then also uh, other providers as needed, uh, thinking about what are the medical uh, aspects uh, that may be interfering with your cognitive issues. So uh, is it a chemotherapy side effect? Uh, in, in which case, you know, uh, we have to set your expectations based on what that means. Um, is, it a, is it something that is related to the hormone treatments, in which case uh, that's something that they may want to address with uh, additional medication or other uh, treatments we'll talk about in a minute. Um, again, we want to make sure that you're getting to talk with a social worker or a counselor or a psychologist either here in the in the cancer center or in the community nearer you uh, to really address the issues of anxiety and depression which are normal and we'll get to those uh, in another episode um, but really recognizing that if those are although they're common and they're normal uh, if they're interfering with your thinking they tend to become magnified right so if I'm anxious and then I I'm so worried about being anxious, I'm not paying attention, and then I get anxious about my forgetting, uh, then we can sort of nip that all in the bud by addressing some of that core uh, anxiety. Um, again, we talked about pain earlier. Again, this is another issue where the pain itself and the pain treatment uh, can become a barrier, uh, and so that's part of that process. Um, and then in general, uh, this is again thinking back to some of the physical stuff, uh, if you're getting up at a normal time, uh, a regular time and going to bed at a normal time, you're getting a full night's sleep, um, you're eating the foods that help, uh, those are all things that will help um, reduce the impact uh, of the, me of the uh, health uh, challenges on your, on your uh, thinking. So then some other strategies, uh, and this is true whether the memory issue is a permanent factor, uh, like you have uh, you know, strokes or uh, Alzheimer's. Some people um, have had those not related to cancer care, but just as a secondary issue. Um, it's also true if you just, you know, you're so tired from cancer treatment you can't think straight. Um, some of these techniques are really useful. So one of the things we recommend is um, setting up what I call a memory center, which sounds more highfalutin than it really is. But basically, it's setting aside some place in your house where you put everything you want to remember. So, for example... Uh, I recommend, you know, setting aside maybe a, a, a space on your kitchen counter or if you have a sideboard or a table when you come in the, in the front door. Uh, and you want to have a, you know, a, if you have a, a house phone, you want to have a house phone uh, nearby. You want to have a calendar. Uh, I recommend like those big desk blotter calendars like you can get at some of the office supply stores only because the bigger squares make it easier to keep track of stuff um, on, the, on the page. Um, you want to have a little bowl for you put your keys. You want to have your phone charger. Uh, you want to have a notepad uh, for writing down messages and putting them onto the calendar. Uh, you want to have a place to put your wallet or your purse or any other electronic devices. The idea here, uh, I'm just going into probably more detail as needed, but the idea here is really to when you come in the house, you put everything that you need in that same space. So that then later, when you want to leave the house to go to an appointment or go out to dinner or movies or see the kids or whatever, you know where everything is. And it just reduces the burden of having to remember where did I put my keys and where did I put my phone and where's my pill organizer and what, who, where's that note I wrote down from Dr. So-and-so or whatever. If it's all in the same place, then it just 
eases the mental burden that we all have. And before cancer treatment, you used to do these things without even thinking about it. Although, if we're honest with ourselves, we probably still lost our keys and still couldn't find our glasses, but we didn't think about it so much as when we do now. So the, the, the idea is you get in the habit of every time you come in the house, you put things in this memory center uh, and it just helps you uh, remember uh, where they are later. Now, if you're uh, a smartphone user, um, it's great. You can use uh, the smartphone. There are audio recording apps you can get uh, in, the, in the app store, whether it's an Apple product or an Android product or some other phone. Um, and you can use the uh, audio recordings and, and actually record a visit with your physician. Um, some people get nervous about that, but I think it's really important to recognize that you're the consumer here and you want to be able to capture the information in a visit as much as possible. We off, Obviously, it's useful to uh, have a, a, a partner uh, to come with you, a personal friend or whatever, to come with you to also be a second set of ears. But in, the, in general, having the ability to uh, use your phone calendar, uh, make uh, audio recordings, that sort of thing, make s set reminders for upcoming appointments. Um, that's all something that can be happened with the, with the smartphone uh, applications. And uh, that's obviously probably going to become more of the common uh, way of doing things in the, in the future. Uh, but for those of us who are sort of slow adopters or late adopters, uh, that's something to, uh, to think about that might help make this easier. If you can just have, as I point out, my brain uh, is in my phone and I just make sure I don't lose it. Um, if you don't have a smartphone, which is fine, um, you can you and you want to record a sessions. Uh, many of the office supply stores have very reasonably priced digital audio recording devices, and you can just say to your physician when you uh, meet with them, "I'm just going to record this so I can listen to it later in case I have any questions or in case I can't remember all the details." What is true is when you're with your medical team, they have uh, 15 to 20 or 30 minutes sometimes uh, to be able to get all the information uh, to you and to hear all of your concerns. Uh, and so there's a lot of information. Those visits tend to be very dense in terms of the information that's being uh, given back and forth. And so being having, having s multiple ways of sort of capturing that information uh, on an audio tape or having a friend come with you and take notes, um, all those things um, can be useful. Uh, another thing that our medical scheduling staff can do is that they can send you an email or even invite you to your own appointment uh, so that it's in your calendar if you use Outlook or any of the other uh, electronic calendar applications. Uh, so then you, and then also uh, the staff will go over and show you the calendar for chemotherapy teaches and when, when follow-ups are going to happen. Uh, so you can also then have a written uh, version of the calendar as well. And, and uh, I encourage people to ask for that uh, if you don't put it into your uh, smartphone or uh, other digital device. Um, so, you know, the multitasking thing, here's the, you know, obviously the simple advice is don't try to be a multitasker right now. Um, I know that sounds frustrating to, to think about, but basically while your brain in your body, your whole body is recovering, it needs the energy for that recovery. So that analogy of the derelict house being torn down, uh, it takes energy to clean up all of the damage that's been done uh, to the cells and all those cells are being replaced with healthy cells and your body is healing. All of that energy, your body's gonna take that energy up front. It's not going to ask your permission. It's not negotiable. It just takes what it needs. So if you're also trying to push yourself and you only have a little bit of energy, uh, that's going to be frustrating. So it's really fine to, for the time you're in, the, especially the first two or three months of treatment, uh, after treatment is over, uh, just focus on taking one thing at a time. And I always think about you want to have a kind of a nice, small, smooth curve. I'm going to work a little and then rest a little. I'm going to work a little, and then I'm going to rest a little. And as I get stronger, I'll work a little bit more, and then rest a little. And I can work a little bit more, and rest a little. But that idea of um, kind of pacing yourself a little bit uh, slower um, allows your brain to uh, have enough energy to do what it needs to do, and you won't be 
piling on the frustration and the sadness of not being up to snuff yet, uh, which also takes more energy and then makes the concentration even harder. Um, thinking about pacing and thinking about scheduling, and this is, gets back a little bit to the calendar and how you, but also how you organize your day. Um, if you know that there are some tasks that we do in life that take more mental focus than others, right? So if I'm going to balance my bank book or do my bills or uh, read a legal document or uh, read a medical report, I want to have as much mental energy as I can. Uh, so um, if I'm going to do those kinds of tasks, it's good to kind of set aside some time of the day when you know you generally have good energy. So, you know, uh, for some people it may be like, I get up, I'm tired, but I have my breakfast, a good nutritious breakfast, I have my big cup of coffee. And so right after breakfast and before lunch, that's when I'm at my peak. So that's the time I wanna go over, you know, legal documents, paperwork, et cetera, paying the bills because that's when I'm gonna be the sharpest. In the late afternoon, when you're tired, that's a great time to watch a movie or you know, listen to music or you know, go for a slow walk around the block when you don't need to have that much mental energy. Again, we're gonna get back to this whole thing. This is gonna come up to be a general theme. Uh, daily physical exercise uh, does keep the body healthy and it also keeps the brain active. And as your body is moving, it's digesting and processing, and that's helping the pro the body itself flush out the the um, the cells that it doesn't want, and helps rebuild that actually healthy new cells um, throughout your body. And the research has been really clear that uh, exercise helps uh, our bodies heal physically from the post. Uh, cancer treatment, but also helps our brains function at its opt at, at the most optimal level. Um, you know, again, um, while you're getting your nutritional consult, <laughs> since I'm assuming that's going to happen, um, while you're getting a nutritional consult, again, this is asking about foods that happily boost energy, um, and uh, this is another good reason for that. Um, if you find that you have been using uh, marijuana products for nausea and uh, emotional uh, distress or using alcohol uh, for emotional distress, um, be aware, uh, right, that there's no sort of moral qualms with this. It's really more about the fact that those are sedatives uh, and they do, they're very effective in managing the nausea, the dizziness, the pain, um, the worry, so they're actually effective, uh, but one of the negative side effects uh, of any of the sedatives, both prescribed and uh, non-prescribed, is that they do make it harder to think. Um, and that you don't have to be, you know, stoned out of your mind or drunk to experience that. Just you know, uh, when you're using those products, um, they are going to interfere to some extent. Uh, with mental processing. So uh, that's just something to be aware of uh, if you're worrying a lot about how you're thinking and then also noticing um, that you're uh, having a, a good couple of cocktails or uh, using a lot of uh, marijuana related products, um, there may be a correlation uh, between uh, the use of the products and the cognitive uh, limitation. So um, forewarned is uh, forearmed in that regard. Um, so learning how to cope with the emotional impact of treatment and at the end of treatment, and it's that end of treatment uh, kind of shock where you don't know what's gonna happen next, and we talked about that in the introduction. Um, you know, I think that's, uh, it's not just incredibly common, I think it's, it's uh, everybody goes through it to some, some degree. Uh, and so learning some strategies for how to manage those proactively, uh, noting that they're normal parts of the treatment process as well, um, can be really useful. I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that here, obviously, because I have a whole episode uh, devoted to that uh, next. But um, this is just a plug for recognizing that emotional factors, and we, you may remember from an earlier uh, slide with the, the tower of ourselves, with the physical being at the bottom, we've gone over the physical, and once that's relatively stable and after treatment, then the next thing up is mental. Uh, but it is true that the very top of the tower, uh, the column rather, is uh, emotional health. And that does have a direct impact on um, our uh, cognitive ability. One of the things we did a, a brief study here uh, at the Cancer Center looking at 
uh, cognition uh, prior to chemotherapy and then throughout chemotherapy. And one of the most clear confounding factors in terms of whether people were having cognitive issues or not was just how anxious they were, uh, which makes you know sort of obvious sense. But I think it's important to recognize that if one's uh, super worried about what's happening, uh, it's really hard to pay attention to the facts and try to rem try to re hard to remember your shopping list uh, if you're worried uh, about um, any number of things. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, so bottom line, so uh, cognitive challenges are common in most people who go through cancer treatments. The, uh, the cognitive effects of treatment often last after the treatment is over, much like the physical recovery if, uh, lasts after the treatment is over. Uh, but it is true that even if the effects do persist, they will not last forever. And even if they're common, they are not inevitable. So one of the things, and, and that lack of inevitability is really getting at this idea, there are things we can do, and there are things that you can do to make it uh, less of a barrier. And, um, and so even though they may happen, we want to make sure that they do not get in your way. There are ways to treat and reduce the effects of any of the challenges that we've just gone over. And uh, again, this is one of those things where uh, people are sometimes reluctant to talk about the cognitive issues because one, it's not, it's not supposed to be part of their cancer treatment and so you know maybe they shouldn't talk to the oncologist about it. Or two, uh, it brings up a lot of worry about, you know, not only did I go through cancer treatment, but now I'm losing my mind. Uh, and so the, the bottom line here is you're not losing your mind. Um, and uh, the more we know about it, we being any of the medical providers, so primary care, primary oncology, uh, radiation oncology, anybody, the more we know about it, the more we can help. Uh, so please don't be shy about mentioning it because uh, even just recognizing that it's normal and reassurance that it'll get better uh, and then doing some of these techniques that we've just talked about uh, can help make it a lot less onerous. So thank you for your time and attention. Uh, that is episode four. Uh, please stay tuned for more episodes.